So hi, everybody. I'd like to uh, welcome Frank Franchetti from uh, CMU. Uh, he's been talking about Spiral, which is a very long running project. And you know, over the last, what, 20 years, I think it's been slowly, slowly making the design of the American libraries more and more generic and more automatable. And now it's actually probably can be described as, as artificial intelligent code. So welcome, Franz. Well, Greg, thank you very much. Uh, my pleasure to be here. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, the Spiral project, as Greg just said. And so Spiral started out um, more than 20 years ago to automate fast Fourier transforms. Back then, FFTs were the big thing because of crystallography and DARPA and radar processing and whatnot. And over the years, the scope has broadened more and more. And now at the end, we're coming back to FFTs because they're actually still important, but they're not the only thing in, the, in town. And so what has turned out that what started out is a compiler project and language project became really something almost like an AI system that captures the information of how algorithms, hardware, software, program transformations, compilers interact. I want to give you a little bit of an idea of how that happens behind the scenes and how that can look to a user and how it's been done. And so this is joint work with the Spiral team and the Spiral team is too large to list. But uh, yeah, been 20 years across CMU, uh, UIUC, Drexel, Spiral Gen, our startup, uh, and also collaborators at uh, LBL and CMU. Sponsored by a host of uh, organizations from federal government and uh, industry. So what, what's the starting off point here? The starting off point is, <clears throat> Google reminding me, so, is that if you look at the time scale of algorithms and mathematics, so um that is quite slow moving so uh algorithms have been around for more than two millennia for example euclidean geometry goes back to 300 bc and we're still using it uh as today uh gaussian elimination is uh, 179 ad not by gauss uh equation of motion go back to newton uh, 1687 uh algorithms are known for over a millennium um the fast Fourier transform now it was invented by Gauss, not by Fourier. And uh, if you look at the fast Fourier transform, you see that it took 200 some years from the initial idea to really where we are right now uh, with fast code. So the math, while it changes, it changes slowly and it's really uh, information for eternity. For example, the Indians used uh, values of pi at the same accuracy that we're using on GPUs today. They could figure that out uh, 800 BC the same way we do right now. Now, if you compare that to the kind of computers that I've been using, and I use myself and uh, I've been using computers for at least 35 years, the slide is a couple of years old, it might be a little bit more than that now. And I have seen personally 10 to the 10 X gain in the time I've been using computers. The first computer was in a garage of my friend, uh, a, a Commodore VIC20 that did about 10 kiloflops, where a flop is a floating point operation per second. And it was uh, happily connected to the family TV uh, at 176 by 184 pixel. Fast forward to my office right now, 4K screen, um, quad core already outdated the whole thing, uh, but has a GPU, my laptop uh, HD, my cell phone HD, right? So been crazy. But on the other hand, you get 110 teraflop. And again, that's 2020, we are 2021. It's more than that now. So you get just from playing games to playing games, so to speak, 10 to the seven already. And then if you go up to uh, the biggest supercomputers like Summit, you get another couple of order of magnitude. So it's been truly astonishing uh, how the computing platforms have changed. Now, I do a lot of work with DARPA. And so here's my obligatory uh, airplanes. And so what you can see here is that the F-16 in all its incarnations is flying as long as I'm on the world, basically. The F, uh, uh, the B-52 is here since my dad's been uh, a child. And it's still the same airframe that's flying. Just all the electronics has been gutted and redone every single time. And if you compare that to what happened at the computer systems, well, 1972, the Intel 808 uh, made its debut. And nowadays, we're still assembly compatible to that on Intel platforms. And since 1989, we are binary compatible. Now, the operating system, the devices, nothing might work anymore, but there are projects that basically try to preserve that. So we have 40 plus years of uh, binary compatibility, 
just the one thing that has changed is now we have 500x parallelism. And so you got to really give a shout out to the computer engineers that could hide that kind of like changes underneath an ISA. So 45 years and nothing has changed, but everything has changed in the same time. Now, look at it from the programming languages perspective. Well, Fortran from 1953 is still being happily used. And one of the latest editions might be something like C Sharp from the year 2000 or Python from 1989. So that's the hot, uh, I mean, not exactly. I know there are other languages, but you see a, a time scale here. The FFTW and BLAS goes back to 79 to 97. So if you now ask someone, will you adopt a new programming language? Given what we see here, the most likely answer is, uh -uh, not going to do it because uh, programmers just really don't want to want change. They want to write single threaded C code or C++ code or whatever, uh, and then let the compiler do the rest. And that's been a hard problem. Now, before I go into the actual technical thing, there's one more thing that I always like to uh, remind myself every year at supercomputing. I go through the booth of uh, through the uh, trade show floor at supercomputing and see what can a million dollar buy myself. So the Austin Powers move, basically one million dollar. What can I do? And so I get something like a couple of terabyte uh, main memory Dell Power Edge. I get couple of hundred terabyte flash drives. I get maybe a box or two of FPGAs. I get maybe a petabyte of spinning disks and I get a couple of GPUs. And now I have to go out and find someone to program that for me. And that's where things fall apart because yeah, for a uh, reasonably small money, you can buy all performance you want nowadays, but getting uh, algorithms onto that is really, really hard. That's where we come in. Because that's where we started out with Spiral many years ago on just a CPU, but now that's the new landscape we have to deal with. So traditionally, what would happen is you have a programmer who has maybe a mathematician friend or a numerical analyst friend or a performance engineer friend, and they go to the library and they get a book, say, on the FFT or on synthetic aperture radar or on AI ML algorithms. Then they sit down, they write something. They try it out, they optimize it. If they work for Intel, they work really hard to get it really fast. If they just work for someone else, they just write something that works. And then a new platform shows up and then they have to do it again and again and again. And so we want to automate that. And it's a little, you know, not really like that, but basically think of the spiral system going to the library, checking out the books, understanding the algorithms, which means algorithm representation and AI of how do you do that? Uh, not machine learning, uh, just look at the data, but really deep understanding of how do you represent the knowledge in the books. And then the system automatically delivers the same thing that the humans would have done before. Now, that would be called high-level programming. And, you know, with Haskell and high-level languages, you can do that uh, since the 1980s. The one thing that's different is that, well, we want to get the same performance that the best assembly programmers can get on platforms that don't even exist yet. So that makes the game much, much harder. So the point is you want to have a library of algorithms and a library of understanding of al uh, how algorithms and platforms interact. So when a new platform drops, you can go in, turn a crank the handle and you have the new library on day one. And you're not waiting on say a department of energy supercomputer that's a couple of hundred million dollars to build. The first two years of early science with no good libraries, no good software because just nothing's there yet. And by the time you have the software, the machine is obsolete and the next one gets bought. So that's basically we try to break that cycle. And that applies really from anywhere from your cell phone and your uh, smartwatch and your RFID tag on the lowest end up to the biggest supercomputer. It's always the same thing that computer architects make amazing machines. Compiler people are trying to catch up in vain because they just can't uh, do all of that so quickly. And uh, the people who buy it say, I'm leaving 80% of the performance on the table. What's wrong here? So the question for the remainder of the talk is, how are we going to do that? And it really breaks down into three parts. The first is, how do you specify computation in that AI sense? And this is not programming. 
this specifying it, and that's not a SAT solver or something very general. It's a very specific representation for the particular domain. Once we have specified the computation, the next question is now how do we get performance from that? And the last question is how do we now present that to users that they don't freak out? Because if you do really sophisticated math and really sophisticated specifications, you uh, cut down your user space dramatically because people usually don't want to deal with that. And so that's uh, what I'm going to spend uh, the remainder of the talk on before I summarize. So Spiral AI for performance engineering, what it does is you, you're given an automatic forward. <laughs> you're given mathematical problem specification. And as we've seen at the beginning of the talk, the core math doesn't really change too much. So it makes sense to catalog that once and for all. And then you have a target computer platform and that changes all the time. And so it makes a lot of sense to have a system that you can explain new computer systems quickly to the uh, automatic system. And what we would like to get out of it is very good implementation of the math on the target platform. And we would like to know it's correct. And then when I say proof of correctness, that can be anywhere from empirical evidence to an actual formal proof in a, in a proof assistant. And when I say performance, I mean something that's as good as the best uh, hand tuners can do. So we're talking horrendous code, source code is the new assembly language. You really don't want to actually look at that. So how do we get there? Well, not in general. We try to simplify the problem. We try to put guardrails on it to make it tractable. And so we basically say mathematics to the rescue. We say all computations are what are in mathematics are operators, which means you are over some kind of algebraic structure and you have vectors over that algebraic structure and you have operators that map vectors to map vectors. And so a simple example would be a scalar product taking two input vectors, point plus multiply, adding them up, map reduce, and you get the resulting scalar product. Now that is very general because your whole computer memory can be one vector of bytes and you can describe any computation if you want like that. Same as map reduce. However, if you go all out, you lose all the power. So it's a real balancing act to not make it too general and make it specific to the particular problem you try to do. But we're building a general framework that allows you to do that. So you don't have to reinvent the plumbing every single time. And so an example would be, and that's out of a DARPA project we did a couple of years ago. Uh, imagine you have a robot that's, uh, or a self-driving car, and you would like to make sure that the thing does not run into the wall or people. And you'll need a proof because otherwise the highway, uh, you know, uh, federal agency is not going to let the thing drive. So you get a mathematical invariant that's really just Newton's law written as an expression that says within a certain epsilon time, how far can I get? And uh, how far from an obstacle do I have to be so that I still can do emergency brake? And so you would usually write it like that. Uh, and that's done with a theorem prover by Andre Platzer at Carnegie Mellon automatically, but you can do it by hand. Now, once you have that, you look at it and this is nice, this is math. You only need addition, multiplication, subtraction, parentheses, so it's fully general. But it's what I would call most mathematical assembly or mathematical pulp because there's no structure here. And you need structure to automate things. So how do we find structure? Well, we define it as an operator that maps the triple of speed position of yourself and position of an uh, uh, of the obstacle to an expression that uses polynomials and Chebyshev distance and higher level math objects that have some intrinsic structure. Details don't really matter, but what matters here is that we just lift up formally and we define a domain specific language that's basically the math you learn in undergrad, but make it a computer language that we can formally reason and use a computer algebra system to manipulate. Now, once we have that, we can see what's the language. And the language at the highest level really is your textbook math from linear algebra or calculus uh, course. So you have these uh, operations that take vectors and produce vectors. They have some mathematical specification. That's not necessarily how you're going to implement it, but you can reason about them. And you reason about them over the real numbers or over floating point numbers or over finite fields, whatever mathematical um, field you want to have underlined. 
It's really textbook, but we add a little bit of stuff to make it automatable, like uh, more explicit domains and ranges of operators and whatnot. Now, what's interesting here is, sorry, a question. Oh, so how does this relate to the to TensorFlow? Because that's part of the, the clearest counterpoint. Yes, exactly. So I think that Spiral could uh, eventually take in TensorFlow uh, operation uh, mm -hmm. specifications. But then, as you will see in the automatic performance tuning, it would do way more aggressive optimizations, I think. So it's really, it, it really uh, we have looked at and thought about uh, how to connect it up with TensorFlow for quite a bit because of mm -hmm. the similarity. The one thing that's different is that the system is not a program, but it spans a search space for a constraint solver to figure out how to do implement it properly. And I think as we see the automatic performance tuning part, we can come back to that and uh, compare notes on how that relates to TensorFlow some more. Okay, so maybe one thing would be great to clear up is how much do you need to know about the computations because TensorFlow allows you to do like a map, generic map operation is legal, yeah. but of course they have no idea what's inside that, that code. Do you need to know that? Yes, the whole power comes from knowing everything. Got it. And uh, that of course uh, takes away generality and mm -hmm. that's the trade-off we are making. Right. You're basically saying, forget your incompleteness, we only do what we know. Failure is not an option. It's a feature. If you don't know how to do it, fail. Don't try. Right. It's not best effort. It's not a compiler, mm -hmm. basically. That's that's the philosophy. You, you zoomed in exactly at the core point of the philosophy here. And I'll, I'll get back to that uh, as we go on. So now the interesting thing is that operators and higher order operators together uh, form basically invariant. You can write expressions and you can manipulate them and you can reason about them and you can break them down and you can lift them up. And so you are basically not in a compiler, but in Mathematica at that point. Uh, and so you have all the algebraic and mathematical power that computer algebra systems do. Now we implement our stuff, not in Mathematica, but in GAP, which is an old computer algebra system from the 1980s that we adopted and extended uh, ourselves. And it's really a combination of prolog constraint solving Mathematica uh, group theory uh, and whatnot. That's a pretty complicated uh, computer algebra system. But it allows you to describe operations similar to TensorFlow, but with the full mathematical semantics behind it. So we know everything in there and we can really, we ask the user to specify everything. Now, if you specify everything, you want to have a big library because otherwise it becomes a very, very onerous. And so we're building up the library of the components that the system understands. Now that's the top level and that's arbitrarily extensible, but then there is a lower level and that is very close to a functional programming language like maybe Haskell or OCaml, where we have the equivalent of map, zip, uh, map and zip, fold, unfold and whatnot. But the map functions are mathematical objects and not programs. And so there's a slight difference there. And you see, you can write, for example, um, scalar product of mapping the, the, the point wise and then reducing it with add. And so that would be how you would do it in the, uh, in the op, uh, functional program. But again, we say it's mathematical, the same object because it's expression. And so what that means is that you have to do a one-time effort to codify the mathematics that people understand and learn in a college into that system. And this is a rule-based system. So it's AI, but the old school AI, not the data-driven AI, if you wish. And so you say, for example, if you want to compute the distance between two points, you have to first subtract the two vectors and then compute the norm of the vector. If you want to compute a scalar product, then you have to first point by multiply and then add up the numbers, map reduce here, the generic map reduce idea. If you want to do a polynomial, you can enumerate all the powers, partially evaluate uh, a scalar product with uh, the coefficients of the polynomial and concatenate the two. That's polynomial evaluation in the simplest case. And so forth. So a human has to go through functional programming and linear algebra and calculus books to write out the domain theory of what's the computation we're doing. And then either a human or an automatic system writes expressions at the top level that then go into the system. And so in that particular project, it was an automatic system, but this is meant for the humans where you describe at the highest level what you know, and you try to write it parameterized as much as you can with high level objects as much as you can. And then the automatic system takes over. 
And at that point, there is a mathematical loop abstraction that implements the standard compiler transformations. There's abstract code in it that implements the classical basic block and backend compilation methods. There's a rule, but everything's rule-based, so you can uh, do theorem improving because a chain of rule applications is correct if every rule application is correct. And so we had students work on that in the Cox theorem improver. And uh, you can write out classical optimizations like merging of two maps into a map where you merge the uh, map function. Things like that are one-liners. And so I do have the details. Uh, we can talk maybe offline some more because this is really just meant to give you a big level of flavor and not to me walk you through all the steps. But once all of that has happened, you get this humongous rule system that goes from a mathematical specification to high performance code in a sequence of uh, rules. Some rule, uh, some rule applications are backtracking search. Some of them are confluent re term rewrite systems. Some of them are visitor patterns that just translate things. Altogether, you might get on the order of a million rule applications. The question becomes, how do you steer a rule system that does that? Well, that's where all the smarts come in to really figure out um, what's the right oracle in the rule system. And then at the end, you get basically high performance. The final code looks like that, which is unreadable, almost assembly code that is not very long necessarily, although it could be very long, but you will have to find the five hand, uh, hand picked experts on the globe who can actually write that because that thing implements interval arithmetic, high performance uh, code and whatnot, and uh, relative to a special instruction set that Intel had, right? So now, but that is mathematically the same thing as the original specification. We can derive a proof that it's really the same. Now, that whole idea is really derived from symbolic integration. For those of you uh, who want to take back a trip memory lane to uh, calculus one or calculus two, I, be I believe. So in symbolic integration, if you remember a little bit of calculus, differentiation always succeeds. You have a rule system and it always goes there. It's so good that you can even automatically differentiate programs. And I think uh, TensorFlow is doing that for uh, they're basically a gradient computation. Automatic integration is a very different beast because if you don't know how to substitute, you go into a dead end. And people for hundreds of years uh, developed these integral tables and you need to really know what you're doing. Now, it's really a search problem and sometimes you just can't succeed and it's a dead end. So if you cast uh, integration as a search problem and whenever you know you cannot get any further, you just have to throw in a new symbol, for example, the gamma function, because you cannot integrate the gamma. There is no closed form solution. You just define a new symbol. So that's the idea. Semantics preserving, because every integration rule is semantics preserving. And it can be automated, as we can see with Mathematica and Maple. So we do the same thing as they do, just we do it for translating a specification into a program and not integrating a formula. But the mechanics behind it is all the same. So if you want to take one thing from the high level thing away is it's really a very different approach to programming. It's not write a program and let a compiler try to see what it understands. It's write a specification with rules and let a rule system figure out how to patch the rules together to eventually succeed. And it's a huge search problem like constraint solving, constraint programming, basically prologue. So that, so that is the question. first, uh, sorry, good, good. Yeah, question about the search procedure. This uh, it seems very related to reinforcement learning, where you're playing a game with somebody else, except the somebody else here is the computer design, the constraints of math, that kind of thing. Is that an appropriate analogy for the search? I think it has similarities, but I think the problem space is way more structured. And okay. uh, the rules really capture domain knowledge. So a rule, uh, as we'll say in a moment, captures known tilings of matrices. Another rule captures known breakdowns that a matrix is a tensor product of matrix multiplies and things like that. And so reinforcement learning is a more generic tool. Uh, you could also think of uh, maybe game theoretic things where you play against each other, right? These are all good notions to think about, but the one thing that's different is that the domain theory is extremely well crafted for scalability. It's a general approach speci specialized for the particular domain. That, that's what, where, where the different come from. Okay, so then maybe there's a key idea that 
uh, I'm currently missing. So um, you said that you can specify any uh, mathematical operations, uh, if you can say how they break down into, I guess it's smaller parts or how they convert it into from high level language to low level language. Um, and obviously you can't say everything in that. So I guess what constraints do you place on spe specifying these high level operations in their implementation exactly. that make and the search efficient? Exact, exactly, and so, and that is where the science turns into art because what you have to do is you, you know that you can generalize it to Turing, Turing complete if you wanted to, right. at which point you lost all the power of the system. So you want to get as only, you want to generalize only as much as you have to. So if you have, uh, if you can get away without uh, data dependent control flow, you are much better off. If you can get away with only uh, compile time known static loop bounds, you're much better off. You can model everything in math. And if you know how to do it, you can survive. But the more restricted you can be, the more powerful the system will be in that particular instance. So then how have you, well, do you place uh, hard constraints on specification so, or do you yeah. just give people this trade-off? Let's table that for maybe two, three slides okay. and uh, you'll, you'll see. So, mm -hmm. because that comes into the second part where it comes achieving performance portability. Because the question only makes sense if you want performance. If you just want to have an answer, uh, the most general approach is great because it will give you an answer. But now the problem is that we actually have that landscape of computing systems that all are very, very powerful, but will only give you good performance uh, if you write the code properly. And you have to write a different code if you run on an Intel multi-core or on an NVIDIA, or if you went to a TPU, or if you went to an FPGA, right? So whatever you target, the algorithm that you need to use has to change. The parameters have to change. And the problems you can actually solve on a particular platform may be different from one each other. So if you have an FPGA, you want to so you use an FPGA for different problems than you use a huge shared memory system or a GPU. And that plays in here. You have to really take that into account in the discussion. And so the basic high level idea is that picture. You have a architecture space that is red and it's parameterized somehow in a very abstract, but uh, in an abstract way. And you get some kind of parameterization of the uh, architecture space and that in a way it defines for you what are all the mathematical fragments that you can execute well. You can either execute something or you can't. There is no notion of, uh, yeah, I can just put a processor in there and it can execute anything. It's really binary. You either do it perfectly or you don't do it. And where you draw the line, that's the, the tuning parameter. And then you have the algorithm space that captures what algorithms can you describe? And again, the gradation. So if you do a, only a two power FFT, you can do it in four and log N and it's perfect. If you wanna do non two power FFT, you have to allow other algorithms and the cost goes up. You really have to make a decision. What are you allowing? What is perfect? That, how big is your space? And the more perfect you make it, the smaller the class of algorithms you can handle gets. And you wanna find the smallest space that will still solve your problem, not the largest one. Now, the trick is that we can describe architectures, algorithms, and program transformations in the same language, that mathematics of the tensor product calculus that goes back to the uh, early 1900s, where they used it for general relativity and other things to describe multilinear algebra. And that language describes memory access pattern, computation, and program transformations in a way that you can trade them off. You can say, what if I transpose a matrix here, or I block the matrix, or I slice it, or I go from two into three-dimensional tensor here, or I, whatever you want to do in your, you can describe all of that in closed form, and you can get expressions that are programs here. And then you, that gives you a search space. And now when you have that, you get um, domain theories, for example, we spent the first 10 years in spiral to describe just linear transforms like FFTs and wavelet filters and JPEG encoders and things like that. And then we spent quite some time to do something like software-defined radio, image processing, things that uh, the military cares about. 
And then we also did a lot of high performance computing simulations, things that the Department of Energy cares about. And we also look at uh, graph algorithms, um, other AI and ML algorithms, because they have lots of sparse matrices. They have lots of uh, dense matrices that are small. So all of that is in the space. And so you have to define a domain theory like that. And every line here is a book chapter or a journal paper worth of an algorithm. And it takes, took 10 years to write all of that. That's like really more 200 journal papers worth of algorithms written in 55 rules that all look pretty much like that. Everyone at a paper, 10 of them a PhD thesis. So that, that's the amount of effort of understanding, putting it into it. And it's there like math for the long term. We still use algorithms that the PhD student wrote in 2004, and we, res we resurrect them now because they are really useful. So now, on the other side, we have one approach for all types of parallelism and hardware. So the approach is forward-looking that we try to make it so it does not matter what hardware is going to come up. And we just got a best paper award for getting spiral applied to quantum computing because Quantum Fourier transform was a master th student, a very smart one, spending a summer for a first prototype and then a master thesis for a reasonable good prototype. And we could just leverage 20 years of stuff and crank the handle and it worked and it was running on the actual hardware producing things. And, uh, you know, I don't really have it in my slide deck, but if uh, you guys might be interested in that and we can talk some more about that. So it directly applies there. So the idea really is to have a playground where you can add new hardware very, very quickly by putting in the structure of the hardware and not having to worry about the low level details and having a nice layered approach that the backend uh, stuff is taken care of easily, but the structural optimizations that one has to do are taken care of and really supported. And so to give you an, a, a little bit of a flavor of how that looks like, Say we wanted to uh, explain to Spiral what a multi-core is. What is a multi-core? Well, if you were to ask a computer architect, they will draw a picture, and then they will give you a spec sheet. So we do the drawing a picture, but we are ignoring the spec sheet. We say, well, a multi-core is a thing that has multiple cores and maybe a cache hierarchy. The idea is that if both cores do the same work, it's perfect. If they do different things, it may not be perfect. If the data set fits in the shared cache, it's great. If not, we have to do blocking and we have to bring in the idea of a cache, which is a different concept from multi-core. Now, what does it mean to have a cache? Well, a cache has cache lines and, has, uh, and cache lines are a level of locality. And because there's a level of locality, we would like to make sure that when a processor touches a cache line, it uses up the whole data in the cache line before another processor uses it. So you see, this is extremely high level concepts that we are teaching the system. And so once we have identified these are the main ideas, we can tell the system, look, that formula here that you don't have to be able to parse, but the system can parse, says that all processors do the same thing and therefore we are load balanced. And that fragment here, again, you don't have to be able to parse it, is a matrix transpose. And if you matrix transpose across cache line boundaries, you get false sharing and you get really bad performance because the cache coherency protocol bounces the data back and forth and back and forth. So we translate a very complicated compiler analysis problem into a very simple pattern matching problem where false sharing is just avoided by rejecting patterns that we know will lead to false sharing. And uh, embarrassingly, parallel operations are favored over operations that are not proper. And we favor breakdowns that keep all processors busy over breakdowns that don't keep all of them busy. And you see, all of these ideas are very localized, very simple ideas, and that's been a search problem. So are these uh, constraints linear or can, well, I'm asking for like a prefetcher because I can see how you could specify for prefetcher that adjacent operations have to be related in a certain way to make sure the prefetcher is kept happy. Assuming the prefetcher is the simple thing, that it features something nasty, yeah. your language has to be compatible yeah. with that. You would uh, specify a prefetcher by the idea that certain memory access patterns are good, which is the same as here. The fact that it's a prefetcher does not matter. The right. fact that a prefetcher has multiple streams, up to eight streams, and every stream can learn a stride, 
And whenever you touch a cash line, you want to bring in the whole cash line. That's the thing that matter. How you call it and how many cycles it take does not matter. Right. It will, and then the system will shape the code to make sure all the codes we get is compatible with the prefetcher. And then it will do automatic performance tuning to find the best parameterization. Right. So it's okay. really imagine having a smart uh, algorithm designer in the room telling the programmer what to try out. And then the programmer just tries out a couple of things and then tells the algorithm designer worked and that's how fast I am or didn't work. Let's try something else. What about the nastier uh, of large scale networks? So on chip networks are fairly simple. Yeah. Uh, but large scale networks, you can have graphs which are factory. I get how that would work. Yeah. But uh, maybe n dimensional torus is also not too bad. But when you have these semi random looking graphs, do you just treat yeah. them as an all to all graph? Well, the question is does anybody have an answer? Oh, fair. If anybody has an answer, no. we formalize the answer. If not, you first do the algorithm research. We will, though, be able to implement things that other people were too scared to implement because we can automate it. So, okay. That, so I would say in that case, let's try the Berkeley approach of streaming a graph through. Let's donate a couple of courses, uh, memory units. Let's try out a couple of crazy things. Everyone would be half a PhD thesis or master's thesis. Let's try out all of those things and see which one works. So, so you, the insight, it sounds like, is you don't, yeah. you're not trying to describe the crazy graph. You're trying to yeah. describe the strategy for communicating over the crazy graph. And that strategy is almost certainly within your language. Yeah, I would also maybe try a thing that as the graph gets loaded, can we histogram it? Can we generate good code to do dy dynamic uh, switching? But somebody either in my team or somewhere else must have had an idea. The system is not all powerful to invent new algorithms. The system is very good in automating what we understand and trying things out without anybody crying about their time lost. Right. So that, that, that is those... very, very important to understand. That makes sense. So somebody figures out how like those optical switches, which have a bounded number of mirrors, somebody says, how do you do it? And the actual number of mirrors is going to be a parameter you yeah. search for, but yeah. you don't care about the mirrors. You care about yeah. the strategy for dealing with them. It's, it's actually even softer than that. Somebody has an idea that might work mm -hmm. and we try it out. Right. You, you don't even uh, need to know how, and we see how good it is. And you know, then the first shot gets us to 50% efficiency. The second shot gets us to 80. We do an analysis that, yeah, we should keep going or we're good enough because something else is the bottleneck now. Got it. That makes sense. And then uh, as we're talking about this, then how does this compare to the, to the memory specification of, of a legion or systems like that? So I think we generally, whatever good ideas are out there, we try to model. Mm -hmm. And we try to take away the cost of the middleware by doing going there directly to bare metal. So that so and we only do where we find a sponsor to make us do it, basically, because we are a university operation mm -hmm. and so we have limited funds. But we have we, we are always monitoring what are the good ideas out there and what are the low-hanging fruits to demonstrate how to do it. And so if there if you if silk is the right idea. We might even implement our own little scheduler that is less general, but more optimized. I, as a young faculty, would spend time implementing better on-chip synchronization uh, locks because I, I walk over to my computer architecture friend. The state of the art is uh, 1,000 cycles. I bring it down to 200 cycles. We can beat FFDW, which was the competitor back then, mm -hmm. by a big factor. Um, we write a supercomputing paper, and then if somebody cares about it, we do more. If not, then we put it in the knowledge base and make get back to it. Okay, so then it, a lot of what you're describing sounds very static. You, it, it's very much like a, a static compiler. Uh, but you're saying it's also reasonable to incorporate dynamic components into this thing, like a dynamic scheduler. Exactly. How do they interact in, in, in so, your compilation? You can think of two ways how to make that work. One way, is, so first, the, the dynamics need to be as little as possible, but as much as necessary. So don't uh, fill up everything with dynamic. Try to chunk it up, allow for more computation, but not too much to keep the pipelines nice and uh, going. And then make the dynamic scheduling as cheap as possible with huge code generation, like switch tables, uh, squeeze, do super optimization in the jump table in order to squeeze out last cycles. 
put the proper compiler hints, all of that. So we have computer architects on the floor we work with, and I had students uh, do that for graph algorithms. Uh, my, one of my last students very rarely would find out what are all the people doing? How do we turn that to 11, so to speak, given my background to see how do you squeeze out another 20% by automation, by just take no prisoners, code mm -hmm. generation, auto tuning. But again, somebody must have had the basic idea and must have abandoned it because it was infeasible to do by hand. Right. That's common. That, that, that's the, that's the trick. No magic, just uh, take the infeasibility off the table. Right. And, and so to give you a little bit more an idea, so that is what matrix, what, uh, the whole PGI compiler understands about matrix tiling is that don't, don't even try to read it. What it means is a matrix can be tiled into two passes of a matrix transposition is two passes where you transpose the blocks and then transpose within the blocks. And the block size should be compatible to the blocking size you need. And the number of blocks needs to be compatible with the number of cores you have. So everything you would like to do in matrix transposition, we just encode as this little rule that then can be recursively blocked into each other. So if you have to block a tensor, then you say a tensor is a matrix of matrices and whatnot. And you can rotate dimensions around and all of that. So this uh, mathematical language of tensor calculus is really extremely powerful. And once you have all of that, you get to the actual automatic performance tuning. And so there you get again, the red color, which is describing the hardware. And that is a algebra, a, a, a space of all possible expressions that the hardware possibly can execute efficiently at full efficiency. And that's a possibly infinite space of programs that really are not lower to programs yet, but they are just data flows. That's what's the left uh, thing here. And that's seeded by some high level architecture specification. And then on the right side, we have the blue bubble from before. That's all ways you can implement an FFT of a certain size. And so now you have an infinite space of all ways you can do, all ways that are configured, I have to say. It's, it's subject to configuration. That goes back to your question of how general it is. You configure the rule system. You say, here is a problem I want to implement. Give me all implementations subject to your rule system. Then you say, here is a hardware. Give me all programs that the hardware can run subject to what your efficiency metric. And then you say, here is all compiler transformations that we will allow. And that are three infinite spaces. And now we intersect them mathematically and then we get a relative small search space of all programs that implement the operation on the target platform subject to program transformations that make sense and that's that black line down here and every point on that line is the solution to the constraint solving problem we never constructed space explicitly but we can walk the space and every point in that space comes with a domain specific program that implements the thing fully efficiently. And uh, basically we know that the compilation stack down from up here will give you as good code as there is. And so the automatic performance tuning now is walking that line, figuring out wh which decomposition in that uh, domain, uh, breakdown system gives the right answer. That's really fast. And you see, we never ever model actual cache sizes, actual cycle counts, actual register numbers or any of that. That's just too complicated to model. Computer architects spend a lot of time for cycle accurate simulators. Why not just run the thing, measure it, or run it against the simulator they give us or whatever it is. We just get the metric back and then we search. And that's the top level. So the top level is this huge constraint solver. And what's left to discuss now is the gray part of the bottom level, which is a stack of multiple rewrite system that will lower the uh, data representation from a tree to a data flow graph to a folded data flow graph to an abstract program to a concrete program to actual assembly and will perform the proper optimizations at every level but we know that all the optimizations will succeed because the system has uh the, the search has pre-specified and pre-massaged the whole thing that everything is confluent and will succeed and you see there are tons of abstractions uh, that do the right thing on the way down. So that, that's the, the trick. So the trick is at the top level, you search, 
you ignore the details and you try out and then you uh, basically use the rule system to go all the way down to the final code. And again, that could be 10,000 or a million rule applications on the way down. Everything from um, the actual mathematics to the actual assembly instruction is modeled in the same language. Memory, communication, vectors, optical, quantum, FPGA, GPU, everything's in the same language. That's the unifying thing here. And what that also buys us is that uh, we, so my, my outlook is not responding right now for a sec, give, give it a moment to see. Uh, I'm doing too much stuff for the poor guy, I guess. So uh, we have, um, let me see if I have to, I, I have uh, a, PDF, if that, if it doesn't, if I talk for a minute and it doesn't come back, I switch to my PDF. Okay. So, so the idea here really is you then can symbolically verify the thing and you can, um, you get all the nice things that you get from, uh, being in a computer algebra system. Okay. Did it come back? Always there. It's still the same slide for us. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, this is always in good recorded talks. That is what ha what happens. I, so you know, I can talk a lot about good uh, computing, but then that of course happens. So let's see. PowerPoint's coming back, and we are. So you should, are you, are you still seeing it? Yep. Um, First slide. That's good. Yeah, exactly. So now let me just quickly go to the proper slide. Is there a better way to do that? That's what we've got just seen. Yeah, so I was talking about, so basically we get all the computer algebra system uh, goodness for uh, verification and correctness checks. So we have uh, plenty of stuff there. But the one thing that you will notice with all of that is I'm speaking, so, and I'm a mathematician by training, and I'm speaking here in a language that usual programmers really wouldn't appreciate normally. And so the question is, how do you wrap that now up so that... Uh, people can use it. And that was really the biggest challenge of the uh, last five years or so, after we've seen that the system can do it all, but how do we get there now? And so we are working with uh, our friends from uh, LBL on FFTX, which is a next generation FFT library, but the same thing, they're also doing GPTLX for graph algorithms and NTTX for post-quantum crypto uh, and number theoretic transform. And quantum uh, op operations, we're, uh, all these kind of things, we are trying to um, basically get a good front end in front of it. And so the idea here is, again, going back to the first slide of people don't want change, but they want the latest stuff. So how do you make that happen? And so the one idea is that actually the, numer the numerical anal analysis people have figured it out 30 years ago good libraries are the way to go. It's just that good old Fortran libraries are no longer the right way to do it. So the question is, how do you take the idea of library from back in the day and lift it up to what um, code generation, automatic performance tuning, just-in-time compilation, and all of that can do for you? And so what we are doing is basically we are slapping a library front end in front of Spiral uh, shrinking the space of the, what people can describe, giving them a language, almost like what the SQL did. You did a SQL uh, library, right? You have a front, you make it an embedded DSL, and then the backend compiler does whatever it is. So we make it either a C++ or a Java or a Python front end library that looks like a standard library. Just what it does is it does delayed execution. You write a whole operation similar to what you guys are doing in TensorFlow, basically, and then you execute it. And the only question is, how do you get people to specify it without knowing that they are specifying? And what you do is basically 
uh, delayed execution and um, memory protection and whatnot. And you tell them you write a program, but you really capture their, pro your, their data flow. And that works very well. And so we've been doing that now in all kinds of ways. And we are having an easier time because we're asking them to write mathematical solvers and not general programs. And so mathematical solvers, you can always draw a bounding box and say, well, whatever comes in is either data or state. Whatever goes out is either data or state. And whatever you do in there, you should be able to describe with mathematical libraries because you don't want to re-implement the math because it's too hard. So you have actually a pretty good case to make. And so an example is you get a thing like that. And that is Poisson's equation in free space, some thing that Phil Colella and uh, Peter McCorkdale and others and Brian von Strahlen, our friends, they write that. And that is a partial differential equation. It uses Green's function and it works somehow. And I've, I'm a mathematician, but I don't really know. And I don't really care to know. Don't tell them. No, I, I care to know, but I, I don't really have to know. So that's how it looks to me. It's a blue box, which is a three-dimensional cube of numbers. The numbers happen to be all real numbers, so means floating point. They get zero extended from 33 cube to 130 cube. Then I have another data cube that's red. That's 65 cube that gets uh, mirrored around in all kinds of ways until you have also 130 cube. Now you do a um, Fourier transform-based convolution. And then uh, when you're done, you only take the upper right 96 cube because that's where the answer is. And for some reason, that solves a partial differential equation. Now, that's how I would like to program. I don't want to deal with anything else. You give me a equation, how to compute all the elements in the red box. And you give me a pointer to an abstract three-dimensional cube that's blue. And you tell me zero pad, convolve, unpad. So that's what we do. We tell them basically in C++, but we also have a C and the, and the Python API. And basically it just says, okay, create a box of that size, create a box of that size, do the convolution and whatnot. What it really is, is it's a specification dressed up as a program. And you only tell the, the programmers, do not try to be smart. Write it exactly as, with as little lines as possible. Don't put any optimizations anywhere. Because what really happens then is you have the executable, there's a call site, and at the call site, actually, a special just-in-time compiler comes in, spiral, that catches what you try to do, and that merges these multiple calls together and then generates the code like a just-in-time compiler. It's really auto-tuning, performance engineering, all the stuff I talked about wrapped up as a JIT. And then it hooks it back in. And I think that would be an awesome project to try to do that together with TensorFlow because TensorFlow has all these informations around. So why not try that? That's actually my to-do list to look at that. And then you get a trace. Doesn't matter how it looks like because it's really, we just captured the DAG. We now know everything because we know because of memory protection and whatnot that nothing else came in and went out. We have the full view. We can do DAG analysis. We can do all the crazy optimizations that you usually never can do because the programmer doesn't tell you everything. So we have solved the problem of capturing the problem specification. Then we have some spiral scripts that look the way they look, doesn't really matter, but they are now the performance engineer captured uh, up. So the performance engineer and the programmer have been separated. And the wall in between that you throw it over has been formalized. It's clear separation of concerns. And that, that's what makes it work. Because usually that's where we spend a year talking to the uh, people. How do you do that? And then we generate the code and the code is fa as fast as what NVIDIA can do or as fast as what AMD can do on the new platform. And that's it. Yeah. And so basically it works. We've shown over the last 20 years that with the right level of effort, we always as fast or faster than what the best hand tuners can do. But we get the same thing on the much earlier, much faster if we have to, because a sponsor wants us to do so. We have uh, targeted a pretty amazing dynamic range from smaller than one watt, watt to 10 kilowatt, really actually to megawatt with the best, uh, with the supercomputers. 20 years of release dates, one core to thousands of cores. So quite some dynamic range. The same 
source code, the same tool always the highest performance. So automation works. It's just quite a long way to go there. And it's really from cell phone to supercomputer. We do graph algorithms in Spiral the same way. There's the big breakthrough that you can write graph algorithms as linear algebra. And since we're at the end of the hour, I just flash it up basically. And you know, we can always have follow-up conversations would be nice, right? So we do it, uh, that's a latest DARPA project for basically teaching higher level stuff to the, uh, to the system, more domains. It's really all about automation and doing Phil Colella's uh, seven dwarfs or 11 motifs, capturing them inside Spiral. Yeah, we do hardware software co-design where we fab chips like RISC-V uh, chips and whatnot because we're an EC department, so we actually build the hardware also. Would also be fun to talk to TPU people. And one of my former students uh, is in the team or was in the TPU team. I don't quite know, but you know. Yeah, so that is really what it is. Um, that's why we call it AI for higher performance code, because it really has transcended a compiler, it has transcended a automatic performance tuning tool. It's really all about capturing the information and automating everything end to end. If you want to play with the system, it's available as open source. Um, don't be surprised if it's hard. If you if it's hard and you want to know more, shoot us an email. It's my ongoing job to beef up the uh, you know training, but it's going to keep me busy the next ten years. This is really uh, you know a, a big thing. I mean, very inspired by Wolfram, basically in that direction, and so. By the time I retire, I want to have some the things still around, uh, really big and keep going, uh, similar to what they have. Not not in scope, but basically, it's really inspiring. So that that's really what drives me. As a faculty member, you have to have big dreams, and that's the big dream. Yeah. So uh, many many people, many more than that, uh, have been part of it. So I just want to acknowledge them all. If you go to the Spiral webpage, you find all the funding agencies and everything.